Hi everyone, so today we're going to derive a moment of inertia. It's the moment of inertia of a regular polygon spinning about its center in its own two-dimensional plane. So I've drawn here a diagram of a regular-ish pentagon, but we're going to do the derivation in the more general case of an n-sided regular polygon. So let's get on with our derivation. The first thing I'm going to do to make it a little bit more uh, manageable is split our polygon uh, into simpler shapes, which are triangles. I should also mention, by the way, that I've drawn the circumcircle of the, uh, the polygon here. We're not going to use that at the moment, but it's going to become relevant later. So um, you can ignore the circle for the time being. So let's split our shape up into, uh, into some triangles like this, right? So here it's a pentagon, so I can split it up into five triangles. But in the n-sided case, uh, we'd be able to split it up into n congruent triangles, right? And they're all isosceles triangles because by symmetry, all of these lengths from the center uh, to a point on the circumradius uh, is, is going to be the same. Okay, so we can start by maybe calling this shape T and we are trying to derive the moment of inertia I of that shape T, right? Of that um, isosceles triangle when it's rotating about this point in the middle there. Okay, so by definition, the moment of inertia is the integral uh, of r squared dm, where m is a little mass element. Uh, you can write it in terms of an area element by just taking out a factor of the density. Here it would be the area density, right? So mass per unit area. There's a row. We're going to assume it's a constant as well, right? Uh, to enable us to actually analytically evaluate this thing. So it's rho times the integral of r squared dA. So a, dA is now a little area element. Um, and to actually do this integral, we're going to have to define a coordinate system. I'm going to draw a little coordinate system down here. Uh, so let's just do Cartesian coordinates, right? So let's say that's the y-axis, that's the x-axis. Here's our origin. And we're going to take shape T, rotate it around so that its axis of symmetry, its line of symmetry is the x-axis, right? So. I'll draw on shape T, that's supposed to be an isosceles triangle, like that. I've just defined the axis so that X lies along the line of symmetry. Okay. Uh, now, if we, uh, we're going to have to you know, define some parameters that describe our polygon. If we call the side length uh, L, then the Y value at the top of this shape T down here is going to be L over 2. And the y value down here would be minus L over 2, right? Now, uh, for the purpose of doing the integral, I should also define one more parameter, which is this x value here. Now, because it's basically the height of the triangle, I'm going to call that h, right? So we've now sort of fully set up our coordinate system and, and described our triangle t in terms of that coordinate system. So when we actually do this integral, well, first thing we can do is put some limits on. So the x coordinate is going to run from 0 to h, right? That's fairly uh, self-evident from the diagram. Now for each particular value of x, your y coordinate basically goes from the bottom of the triangle to the top of the triangle, right? So if you take this x value, right, your y coordinate starts down here and ends up there. So we need a way of writing those y limits in terms of each particular x coordinate. Um, <clears throat> now, one way to do that is just notice that the slanted sides of this triangle are just straight lines. So if you knew the equation of those straight lines, you'd be able to know the y values uh, along those lines for any particular value of x. And they're straight lines that pass through the origin by definition of my coordinate system. The gradient of, uh, let's say, this uh, line up here is going to be L over 2H, right? Just L over 2H by changing Y over changing X. And similarly, the gradient of the bottom one is going to be minus L over 2H because it's sloping downwards. Um, so the equation of these lines, it's just going to be Y equals gradient times X, right? Because they go through the origin. So that enables us to put the limits on, right? The lower Y limit for every value of X is going to be minus LX over 2H. Uh, and the upper limit is just going to be positive 
lx over 2h. And the thing that we're integrating, our integrand, uh, is x squared plus y squared, because that's the same as r squared, distance from the origin squared, right? And our area element Cartesian coordinates is just d y by sorry dy dx i put the dy first because we're going to do the y integral um, first now before we start uh actually evaluating the integral i'm going to use a little symmetry trick to make our lives a little bit easier and notice that um so the first thing we're going to do right, is integrate with respect to y but x squared plus y squared is an even function of y right and so because we're integrating an even function across uh we're integrating over a symmetrical range right from minus lx over 2h to positive lx over 2h um, we can instead just integrate from zero up to the upper limit and then multiply the whole thing by two right if you were to visualize x squared plus y squared as a function of y on a graph it would just be a, a parabola right a, a quadratic curve which is symmetrical about the origin so instead of integrating from minus some value to positive some value you can just integrate from zero up to the upper limit and times by two right so uh just saves us a little bit of algebra later on so i can write this integral as two rho times the integral where x goes from zero to h and then the integral where y now goes from zero uh, up to lx over 2h and the same integrand right x squared plus y squared dy dx it's not really a necessary step but it does make things a little bit more convenient later on so let's just go ahead and do the y integral first, right? So we've got our two row. Uh, the x integral is still going to go from zero to h. When you integrate x squared with respect to y, you just get x squared y. You can go straight to plugging in the limits. It's going to be x squared times that upper limit, right? So you're going to get x squared times lx over 2h. Then when you integrate the second part, y squared with respect to y, you get a third of y cubed. So you get a third of this whole upper limit cubed, right? So it's going to be a third of L cubed x cubed over 8h cubed, where h was that height of the triangle that I defined at the bottom left. And that is now, uh, now needs to be integrated with respect to x. So... Uh, just to make, again, just to make it a little bit more convenient to do this, we can notice both terms are proportional to x squared, so we can take out a constant factor at the beginning. It's going to be 2 rho, and then the coefficient of x cubed um, for the first term is just L over 2h, so I can pull out a factor of L over 2h there. And then for the second term, it's going to be L cubed over 24h cubed. Right, and now my integral is this simple looking thing from zero to h of just x cubed dx, right? Uh, and so when we do the integral now, it's just h to the power of four over four, and we end up with h to the four rho divided by two, right? Because there is a two there and we divided by four, uh, and then times all of that stuff in the brackets, l over two h plus l cubed over 24 h cubed. All right. Um, now, let's see if we can make this expression look a little bit nicer. Um, we can pull out a factor of L over 2H as well. Okay, so if I do that, I get rho L H cubed in the front, rho L H cubed um, over 4. The reason why it's maybe nice to do that is because the first term then just becomes one, right? The first term in the brackets is now just one. The second term has to become L squared over 12 H squared. Okay. Now, um, you could, instead of writing it in terms of the density, you could write it in terms of the mass of triangle T, right? So it might be nice to have our final expression for the moment of inertia of the polygon in terms of its mass. Uh, so let's write the moment of inertia of the triangle in terms of its mass um, as well. So the mass is just the density times the area, but the area of a triangle, I'm going to say A subscript T, is just a half um, base times height, right? Now, um, the base of the triangle is L, right? And the height is H. That just follows from that diagram uh, that I drew at the bottom left here. So if you use the fact that the mass of the triangle is the density times a half LH, 
you should be able to convince yourself that this turns into mass of the triangle using m subscript t for mass of the triangle times h squared divided by 2 um, and then you get again 1 plus l squared over 12 h squared okay so here's where we start to make the the link to sort of the shape of the polygon right um, what you can do is define an angle here right it's because th this h parameter it's it's fine to have this here but it's not really a fundamental property of the polygon right it's just a useful length to define so what would be a more i would say sort of fundamental property of the polygon is this angle at the center which i'm going to call theta right so we'll write that later on in terms of the number of uh, sides of the polygon but let's see if instead of writing this in terms of uh, l and h let's see if we can write it in terms of l and theta um, and you can do that just using a little bit of trigonometry <clears throat> so again looking back at the diagram at the bottom left this angle that i'm working on now that's theta over two right because our x axis cuts through the line of symmetry and so you can just do trigonometry and say tan of theta over two uh, it is the opposite side which is l over two divided by the adjacent side which is h so tan of theta over two is l over two h and so you can use this to essentially eliminate h um, from from this equation up there and and that h as well okay so what's going to happen is uh we will end up with mass of the triangle divided by two then our h becomes uh l over 2 tan theta over 2 so we then get a l squared over 4 tan squared theta over 2 uh, fortunately that one is still just a one and then with that second term uh, because l over h uh, is equal to 2 tan of theta over 2 you get 4 tan squared theta over 2 divided by 12 all right then we can multiply at the brackets do a final little bit of algebra and you'll end up with the mass of the triangle mt times l squared over 24 multiplied by 1 plus 3 times the cotangent squared of that angle theta divided by 2. okay so we've got the moment of inertia of one of our little isosceles triangles in terms of that central angle theta here's where we can start to make the link to the overall polygon right so if there are n sides that means because there are two pi radians or 360 degrees in a full circle uh, our theta is just going to be two pi uh, divided by the number of sides n right uh, and therefore the argument of our trig function is just going to be well it's theta over two which is pi over n so i can replace this theta over two um, in the cot squared with pi divided by the number of sides uh, and then all we have to do to get the full moment of inertia of the polygon is to note that well the overall moment of inertia because moments moments of inertia are additive as long as they're about the same axis right you can just take the moment of inertia of your, of your triangle and multiply it by the number of triangles because each of those moment moments of inertia is about that same central point so we can just add them together which is the same as times in by n uh, because they're all the same right because they're all congruent triangles and similarly the overall mass if i just call that m it's just n times the mass of the triangle because you're again splitting your polygon into n smaller triangles so um, using those two facts we can arrive at our basically our final answer which is going to be m uh, times l squared divided by 24 uh, and then 1 plus 3 cot squared of pi over n right notice that there's no n uh, over here because if i take my equation up at the top we've got an i t moment of the triangle on the left and you've got mass of the triangle on the right so if you multiply both sides by n uh, then you get i and m but the n's you know you've, you've multiplied both sides by n right so that's not going to appear in the, the final equation so there's one more interesting thing that we can do which is to consider the limit of this expression as you take the number of sides 
of the polygon to infinity, right? Here's where that circumcircle that I was mentioning earlier becomes relevant because the limit um, as the number of sides goes to infinity of a regular polygon is just a circle. So to, to investigate what happens there, we're going to define yet another parameter, which is the radius of the circumcircle, um, which is like this distance on the diagram here, right? Distance from the center to any of the vertices. And again, using uh, trigonometry, you find that sine of uh, theta over two is going to be looking at this diagram at the bottom here. It's the opposite side, which is L over uh, two divided by the hypotenuse of that triangle, which is that circumradius R, right? And I may as well replace this theta over two with pi over n. So sine of pi over n is L divided by two R. And then uh, we're going to substitute this expression uh, to, to eliminate the L from our polygon moment of inertia, right? So if, if you're just dealing with a polygon, it's maybe more useful to have it in terms of the side length. But if we're going to think about the limit um, as the polygon tends to encircle, it's going to be more useful to have it in terms of this radius. And so uh, what you get is M times R squared times four sine squared of pi over N divided by 24. And then you get the same trig factor, right? One plus uh, three cot squared of pi over n. Uh, so then if you multiply, uh, well, okay, firstly, we can just cancel the 4 and the 24. You get mr squared over 6. Then you multiply the sine squared factor into the brackets. You get um, sine squared of pi over n plus 3 cos squared of pi over n. That second bit follows from basically the fact that tan, tan of any angle is sine of the angle divided by cosine of that angle, right? And therefore sine times cotangent is the same as cos. So you get this, and then all we have to do is do the limit as n tends to infinity of i, which is mr squared of six, the prefactor doesn't change, um, but pi over n is going to zero, right? As n goes to infinity, sine of zero is tending towards zero. So the first term becomes zero. The second term, however, is tending towards cos or oh, cos squared of zero, but cos of zero is just one. And so you get plus three times one. And this simplifies to just a half MR squared. So there you go. There is a very uh, impractical way of uh, deriving the moment of inertia of a circle as well. And it's just kind of satisfying to see um, that you can take this limit and arrive at a result that's consistent with what we get from uh, simpler methods.